In this session, we're going to look at a very useful classifier called the Naive Bayes classifier. Similar to k-nearest neighbors, we have the same concept of similarity going on. Remember that searching for keywords on Google or getting an insurance uh, quote by entering your information is based on finding people or users who are similar to you in terms of your predictor profile and based on that predicting your outcome. The same idea is behind the naive base. So the idea of classifying a record by looking at all similar records in terms of their predictors is the same. The difference is that similarity in the naive Bayes context is based on the notion of probability rather than distances. So how does this work? What we're trying to estimate is the probability that the output is equal to 1, let's assume it's a binary output, given a certain predictor profile. Let's say age equals a certain age and education is a certain education level, etc. The idea is to look for other users or other records that have the exact same X profile and then compute a class probability based on that subgroup. Now, unlike other methods, this particular method can only use as inputs categorical predictors. So things like gender are fine or age level is fine, but if you have anything that's numerical in a predictor, you'll have to convert it into a categorical predictor. We're going to use the same personal loan offer example that we used earlier on. And remember that Maharaja Bank is using information from a previous offer campaign in order to try and build a smart algorithm that will help them decide who to send a new offer to. Their goal is to improve target marketing and by identifying the customers who are most likely to accept the loan offer. The data dictionary shows that we have the outcome variable being personal loan, and that's a binary outcome. We also have a bunch of um, demographics and banking uh, variables that are listed in this history and also available in the Excel file. Let's start with a very simple primitive idea. And basically, you can think of naive Bayes starting from a pivot table. Suppose we're only looking at two predictors. For each customer, whether that customer owns the bank's credit card, one for yes and zero for no, and whether they do online banking, one or zero. Our outcome of interest is again why, whether they accepted the offer, one, or not. So let's just create a pivot table like the one here at the bottom. And I have columns for the online users and zero for the non-online users. And we have separate rows for credit card. And we have sub rows for the personal loan. If I want to estimate the probability that a bank customer who owns the credit card does do online banking, what is the chance that this person will accept the offer? I'll look into the online people and in particular into those who have the bank's credit card. And we see that from the 511 customers who own the bank credit card and do online banking, only 50 people did accept the offer. So our best estimate would be 50 divided by 511. So this is a very nice and easy idea. What's the difficulty? In this case, if we only use two predictors and each one is 0, 1, then we have four types of profiles of customers that we can look at. We can look at people who, who do have the credit card and do online banking, who have the credit card but don't do online banking, and in general we have four types of people. In order to be able to estimate probabilities of acceptance, we're going to have to have in our training data all these four types of customers. The problem is that with only two predictors, you might be able to find four types of customers. But as you increase the number of predictors, you might have some profiles which do not exist in your training set. And then how do you estimate the probability? You have no instances to learn from. Let's just look at a slightly bigger problem. We're just adding one more predictor, which is whether the customer owns a CD account or not. And I created a pivot table that just adds this one additional predictor. You'll notice right away that there's an empty cell and this empty cell arises because none of the 3,000 customers in our training set have this profile. No CD account, they do online banking, and they own a credit card. So now, if I want to predict for a new customer who has this profile whether they'll accept the offer or not, I have no information whatsoever. And this is the problem that raises the need for moving beyond just pivot tables. So the idea 
behind Naive Bayes is to move from looking at large pivot tables that have cross crosses of all our predictors into individual pivot tables. In particular, we're going to look at a pivot table of y versus x1 and another pivot table of y versus x2, etc. Each one of these pivot tables is not likely to have missing cells. Well, if we have these individual pivot tables, first of all, how do we actually put them together to get the probability that we want? We're going to have to use a few probability tricks, and for that I'm going to introduce you or reintroduce you to Bayes' rule. Then I'll show you how we have to make some simplifying assumption, which we're actually going to be violating up front. And the interesting thing is that even with this violation, we get a very powerful classifier. So let's delve into this mystery. Remember conditional probability from your basic course. Assume that we have two events. A is the event the customer accepts the loan. B is the event the customer has a credit card. This notation here means the probability of event A given that event B occurred. So in this example, this means the probability that the customer accepts the loan given that he or she has the credit card. And the equation for conditional probability is given below, where it's equal to the probability that both A and B events occur, divided by the probability of B. Just a small refresher. Let's go back to our pivot table. This is the first pivot table we looked at. How do I know that this number that we computed, 50 divided by 511, is a conditional probability, and not, for instance, just a cross probability. The reason is that we conditioned by looking at a particular column and a particular row, and then divided the numbers accordingly. That's what tells us that we're looking at conditional probability when we're looking at a pivot table. Instead of looking at this cross table, instead we're going to look at two separate um, pivot tables in this case, one for Y and online, and the other one for Y and credit card. Before we move any further, just to make sure that you figured out how to estimate a, a conditional probability using a pivot table. So suppose we have a customer who does not have a credit card and does not do online banking. What's the probability that that customer will accept the offer? Stop the video and see if you can figure this out. Now, let's move to the next step. So the first idea of moving from a cross pivot table to individual pivot tables is based on the idea of splitting a combined probability, a probability of a com combination of events, into a multiplication of probabilities. Now, this equation is correct only under a particular assumption. If these x's, conditional on y, are conditionally independent, then this equation is correct. What does this mean? It means that if the different predictors are independent of each other when we only look at acceptors, if those predictors are independent, then this equation is correct. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that this is correct, even though this is unlikely to be correct, because usually different predictors will actually be con conditionally dependent. So for example, if I wanted to compute what is the probability among those who did accept the offer of having online banking and a credit card, I would split it into a multiplication of these two numbers right there. Now, this is not exactly what we need, because what we need is the opposite direction. We need the probability of y equals 1 conditional on the predictors. So we're going to have to need, use another probability trick in order to flip things the other way around. And that's where the Bayes formula comes in. And this is a caricature of Reverend Thomas Bayes, who came up with this really ingenious trick. And the idea of Bayes' formula is reversing the direction of a conditional probability. If you give me probability of A given B, I can compute the probability of B given A. So here is Bayes' rule. And for a more extensive coverage, please go back to the notes from a previous course. What we're trying to do here again <clears throat> is we're trying to obtain the probability that y equals 1 given a predictor profile. However, it's easier for us to estimate the opposite probabilities. 
So we're just going to link them through the Bayes rule. And I can write out this equation in the form that's written just below it. Just a small nugget. If you think that Bayes' rule is just a theoretical concept, you're very wrong. Besides naive Bayes, which is based on that idea, there are also some applications behind the scenes, such as Microsoft's paperclip that used to help you out uh, in Word documents. OK, let's get back to our naive Bayes derivation. Here's the idea. This is the probability that we're interested in estimating. However, we're going to flip it using Bayes' rule. Had we had all the possible combinations of profiles in our data set, we could actually stop here and use the Bayes rule to obtain the probabilities, like we did for the original example. However, because of sparsity issues and the lack of different combinations of profiles in our data set, we're going to go to a conditional independence assumption, which means that we're going to approximate this formula with an expansion of this combined profile into single attributes. And what we have here are pieces that we can estimate from our data set. For example, the probability that y equals 1 can be estimated by the proportion of loan acceptors in the training set. If we want to look for people who have accepted the loan, we want to find out what was their probability of, say, having a credit card, we can go and find that out from a pivot table of x, x1 on y. And similarly, we can get all these numbers from the individual pivot tables of y on each one of the individual predictors. And finally, in the denominator, we need to find the proportion of customers that have this particular combination in the data set. Now, of course, again, we can have the same problem where we don't have this particular profile in our data set, and then we'll break this down using conditional independence. Let's think for a minute what this simplification means. When we're substituting a probability of an entire profile by individual attributes and multiplying them, it means that we're assuming a conditional independence between owning the bank's credit card and doing online banking for a particular class, for the acceptors or for the non-acceptors. Now, although these two predictors are likely to be dependent conditionally, if the dependence is not extreme, we can still get a pretty nice and smart classifier. And I'll show you how this works. So here's the pivot table that we had originally. And all I'm doing here is I'm going to show you what happens when we flip the probabilities using Bayes' rule. So this is step one. We can estimate each of these probabilities. Again, we see that the proportion of acceptors is 286 divided by 3,000. Where do I find the 286? I'm going to look for all the acceptors. So these are the acceptors, and those are the acceptors, and divide that by 3,000. This probability here means that we're going to look at the people who accepted, and among them see what proportion had a credit card and did online banking. So we see that only 50 out of these 286 had this profile. And in the denominator, we can see that among all the 3,000 customers, <clears throat> 511 had this particular profile. You can compute this and see that you get the exact same probability that we computed earlier on. Thus far, we made no approximation and no assumption. I simply used Bayes' rule. Now let's do the next trick, where we're going to approximate this by replacing the pivot table that crossed everything with two individual pivot tables. One is a pivot table of online banking versus Y, and the other is credit card versus Y. I'm going to replace this probability by the single probabilities that I'm going to get from these individual pivot tables. How do I get the numbers now? Given that you're an acceptor, What's the probability that you have a bank credit card? I'll go to the lower pivot table, and here are my acceptors. And among these 286 people, I see that 86 actually own the credit card. That gives me this number right here. Stop the video right here and see if you can derive the other numbers. Finally, you see that we get a probability that is slightly different from the exact probability. 
And remember, this is an approximation that is based on an assumption that is being most likely violated. However, the number is pretty close to the exact number. They're both pretty close even to a second decimal. Now, when we run Naive Bayes in software, what we'll get is basically the pivot tables that we were generating one by one in a nicer fashion. I used the exact same data <clears throat> with these two predictors, online and credit card, and ran it in Excel Miner. And what we get is for each one of the classes, these are the acceptors and here are the non-acceptors, we basically get pivot tables. And if you look at the probabilities, you'll see that this is exactly the probability that we computed earlier on. And in fact, if we go and score the training data or the validation data, in this case, it's the validation data, I can go and look for a particular profile in the validation data. And for this person who does online transactions and has a credit card, we see that the prediction is a probability of 0 0.103. And this is the naive Bayes probability. Using a cutoff of 0 0.5, this is converted into a classification of no. This customer is classified as someone who will not be accepting the offer. Let me piece everything together. So first of all, remember that the naive Bayes requires categorical predictors. So if you have numerical predictors, you're going to have to go through a binning stage. Next, how do I train the data? I train by estimating the proportion of class one records and then simply obtaining individual pivot tables, if you want, for each predictor versus the Y. This is very cheap to compute. And that's why Naive Bayes is going to be very popular in huge problems. Once I have the training results, I can move to prediction. So if I'm trying to classify a new record, what I'm going to do is compute the class probabilities via this formula, which will give us this approximate Naive Bayes probability. And if I want an actual classification, as usual, I'll just use a cutoff value and translate the probability into a class label. What are the weaknesses and the strengths of the Naive Bayes classifier? The good is that it's relatively simple. If you think of pivot tables, that's what Naive Bayes is doing with a little twist on top. The other big advantage of Naive Bayes is that it can handle a very large amount of predictors because all it takes is generating another very simple pivot table. It turns out that the Naive Bayes has a very high performance accuracy, especially when we care about ranking. If you remember, ranking means we're interested in the top tier of a certain sample. If what you really care about is obtaining the exact probabilities, then Naive Bayes is not going to be a good solution and will give you biased probabilities. Finally, although we're making an assumption and violating it up front, as long as you care about ranking, that's not going to matter at all. The weaknesses of this classifier is that, again, you're going to have to bin your continuous predictors. And the other problem is that because you have to be able to see all the possible profiles that you'll want to predict in the future, if you have predictors that have very rare categories, suppose it's a postal code with very few people who live in that area, then that will give you a zero probability. And there's some ways of tweaking that and avoiding that, but it's a problem that is built into this classifier. Another problem is, again, if you're not trying to rank, but you're actually interested in the class probabilities, then you're getting biased results. And finally, it is also a black box in the sense that we don't know which ones of the predictors actually um, led to the accuracy of the output. So with this, we've talked about two classifiers. Both of them are very data-driven. The user hardly needs to specify anything. And they both measure similarity in terms of a predictor profile, but they define it using a slightly different metric.